Uh, thanks everyone for, uh, for having me. And, uh, apologies, my voice is slightly going. Uh, and I've also been told to stay near to the microphone, but I have a tendency to, to sort of waft around the room. So uh, if you can't hear me at any stage, or if you have questions, don't, please feel free to fire away. Um, a little bit about Aqua Ocean. So we're two years old. Uh, we're a UK-based startup developing the world's first hydrogen-powered autonomous surface vessel. So we're really working at the convergence between megatrends, hydrogen technology, robotics, automation, <coughs> AI, edge-based processing, but also new emerging trends in terms of blue technology, um, the blue economy, finance, natural based uh, financing systems as well. So a little bit about sort of the, the background of the business, how we sort of came about. Essentially, we saw a real, real challenge when it came to automation. And in particular, the uncrewed surface vessel space, which has traditionally relied on sort of uh, very stagnant sort of design principles. And, and you know, today's not a, I'm, I'm not trying to sell you warships and uh, sort of defense capabilities or surveying or sort of data capabilities. But I was just going to use this as an example to sort of tell a bit about our stories, where we've seen opportunities, where we've seen challenges from a design perspective, and how that's implemented and sort of uh, affected our thinking as we've gone along. So I'm Chief Operating Officer at Acquiration. Uh, my background is the last 12 years in startups, so it has literally been over a decade since I had a proper, proper grown-up job. Um, I have spent some time in venture capital. I've spent some time in financial technology startups. I, I spent some time working in health tech startups and then sort of co-founded this along with my brother in 2020. In the middle of COVID, we thought, you know, what, a better, what better way to spend sort of COVID than planning to build a great whopping big ship? And actually, a couple of slides uh, time, I'll talk you through some of the, the actual sort of characteristics of this vessel, the design of it as well. But just as you look at this sort of, I like to think it's a pretty picture, uh, but just to give you a bit of a comparator, this is a 21 ton ship. So this isn't a small, like, sort of fit in your bathtub sort of toy. Uh, this is, yeah, this is 13.5 meters long, eight meters wide, modular capabilities, which we'll go into in a, in a second or two's time. So, kind of some of the, um, some of the sort of principles I'd like to sort of take you through today, and obviously, Joe, I'm really interested in your feedback as well as your questions as well. So, really looking at this from uh, a couple of sort of key points I'd like to touch on. So, autonomy for problem solving, actually how autonomous systems can enable us to solve some of the most complex uh, challenges facing the world. Uh, enabling technologies like hydrogen, why that has enabled us to be different to other operators that are on the market at the moment. Um, the need to actually sort of start thinking outside of the box from an autonomous perspective as well. Uh, then to sort of dive into the need for scale from autonomy and how that would support it. And finally, uh, what I've called rapid autonomous uh, force or augmentation, which is also fleet augmentation as well, which is we move into sort of requirements for additional capabilities. How can we be developing autonom uh, autonomous systems at scale to deploy quickly in times of need? And this could be Everything from sort of agri-tech, where you've got sort of picking seasons, uh, but you've got sort of severe labor shortages. I think we've also been aware of sort of Brexit of some of the challenges that have been faced in that environment. Uh, Joe, in terms of sort of hospital and care, where there is a critical sort of shortage of people who are sort of involved in sort of triage uh, medical treatments. But most sort of pertinent to the discussions that we're having is from a defense perspective. I think uh, you only have to look at some of the, the news that's been coming out of uh, the sort of conflict in Ukraine to understand the importance that autonomy, robotics, and drones have started to play in that conflict in particular. So when we talk about autonomy, what we're really looking to do is to solve four problems. Dull, dangerous, dirty, and distant jobs. This isn't about replacing people you know, in everyday jobs. That, that's not why I got into this space. What we're looking to do is essentially is to reduce humans at point of conflict. So when it comes to the defense sector, this is about moving, you know, in the instance we talk about removing the, mi uh, the man from the minefield. It's about removing people from areas of conflict and actually sort of replacing those with autonomous systems that can do dangerous jobs like mine detection, surveillance, subsea inspections, where you don't want the person in that role. The distant jobs, the ones that are over the horizon, which are going to take people out, you know, out of their comfort zones. Who, who wants to go to sea for six months and bob up and down in the north, you know, in the North Atlantic, looking for Russian submarines, uh, when you could instead be in a nice, sort of dry, comfortable uh, operation centre? The dull jobs, picking, you know, agriculture. Those are the jobs that are paid least because nobody really necessarily wants to do those jobs. Um, so. Uh, uh, a little bit about sort of um, autonomy and how we can solve it, solving some, some really, really critical sort of uh, problems. So we at Aquarotion started talking 
probably about 18 months ago to some of the utility providers around critical national infrastructure. So if you had a you know, nuclear power plant on land, you've got security personnel. You've got people guarding this and monitoring it at all times. So we, we went out and we were talking to some of the big energy providers, the utility companies, and saying, look, these offshore wind farms, by 2030, about 15 million UK homes are going to be powered by offshore wind. How are we protecting those? Data cables, 95% of all UK financial transactions, they don't go by satellite, they go via subsea cable. So what happens if somebody blows up a cable? And I remember sitting in these conversations time and time again. People are like, is that really a problem? Is that an issue? Well, hell yes. I mean, I think Nord Stream was the best, uh, sort of the best sort of PR sort of media story when it came to actually the impacts this could have. And then a couple of weeks later, cables get cut to the Shetland Islands. Cables get cut in France, uh, sort of West Africa as well. So what we're seeing is a recurring threat to uh, sort, of, uh, sort of infrastructure, be it offshore, be it on land. So we still really see an opportunity for autonomous systems to start playing a really sort of impactful role in this because they have the ability to scale, they have the ability to operate in extreme environments where other assets can't. And this enables us to start thinking about new ways to solve very, very complex uh, sort of uh, questions and, and challenges. And these are just some of, some of the examples of some of the threats, uh, you know, talking to the US Coast Guard around the, uh, the defense sector. One of the big challenges they're facing is so much of uh, US wind is now moving towards floating wind farms out in the Bering Sea off the coast of Alaska. One of the challenges they've really got there is, you know, do you want to deploy a, a sort of a Coast Guard vessel bobbing up and down sort of endlessly at sea, not seeing anybody for sort of weeks and months on end? Until a couple of weeks ago, when they discovered a Russian and Chinese fleet conducting a joint operation in US territorial waters. So the threats are real, and they've been coming for some time, we've just been ignoring them. But the challenge we've had from an autonomous perspective is a lot of the design that we've been seeing has been based upon repurposing existing preconceived of ideas of what a solution could look like and just making it autonomous. There's been no sort of whole scale rethinking of what does autonomy mean that could be different. So two examples here. Uh, probably the easiest to explain is the one on the left, Mad Fox. So this is the Royal Navy's new sort of rapid, uh, sort of, uh, I would say, interception vessel. Costs about sort of six million pounds in R&D. Goes at 45 knots, lasts six hours. After six hours, it has to return to base to, uh, to refuel diesel engine. You might, if you're lucky, get 10 hours out of it. Uh, but essentially, it's using an existing uh, it looks like every other boat that you know, every, every other speedboat everyone has done. Incredibly limited systems. And this is where we're starting to see new enabling technologies come through because you know, what, the first thing that fails on a diesel vessel is the engine. You've got moving parts, they need oil and filter changes, they need maintenance. If you're moving towards autonomy, there's this huge limitation of the fact that actually if something breaks down and you're autonomous in the middle of the ocean, it's going to be more expensive to go out and retrieve your asset than it is if you're actually sort of building towards a new future. And this is where we see the likes of enabling technologies like hydrogen, power for payload, uh, PEM fuel cells, which means sort of actually no moving parts, uh, so you actually have sort of a chemical reaction rather than the need for sort of complex engineering. So the PEM fuel cell that we use on Aqua Ocean's vessel means that we have a visual inspection once a year rather than these oil and filter changes every 250, uh, 250 or so hours. Uh, the other alternatives that we see in this space are sort of again deploying very traditional designs. Don't everyone see the, the same boats sort of designs? So this is a sail drone. They raised 100 million US dollars uh, to develop out their solar powered vessel. Um, exact opposite end of the spectrum, actually. Uh, so it can go at four knots. Uh, Mad Fox can go at 46 knots. Uh, but actually, um, sail drone, four knots, no power for payload, no ability to collect data. We really saw this as a limiting factor. So you kind of ended up with things in two, you know, either no endurance, i.e. you spend most of your time either going out to site or coming back, operational downtime, because you've actually you've got a sort of transit back and forth, or from a, um, or from a sort of design perspective for the sail drives, they can stay out at sea for a year, they can't collect anything. There are no commercial actual sort of use and viability. Um, we were spoken to end users, I mean, you can get some basic meta-ocean data out of those, um, but they'll cost you, you know, anywhere between two to $3,000 per day uh, to actually operate, but they've got no ability for satcoms or you know, very very low capabilities when it comes to satcoms, uh, low speed, so they can't do things like security monitoring and the likes. So, what we've seen traditionally is the challenge is as soon as you want to on any vessels like those, as soon as you want to have more capabilities, 
you end up with this challenge that you're just designing an existing concept and design, and you're just making it bigger, which makes it more and more expensive. So in the instance of that sail drive vessel, they took their 10 meter vessel and made it 24 meters. And the price went up from 2 million, roughly to build 7.5 million. The price per day on one of those vessels to get slightly nearer to a capability whereby there were sensors on board to do subsea, sub-ocean sort of inspections and the likes, went from two or $3,000 per day to 30,000 US dollars per day. And that's just simply because of the design limitations in terms of thinking where this came from. So we've taken an entirely different approach. I'm not gonna say we've taken the right approach. That's still to, still to be seen. But at Ocean, we have designed, as I said, the world's first hydrogen-powered autonomous surface vessel. They're taking a very novel and unique uh, sort of approach. And I did actually have a slide here, which was that QI thing, which is a you know, wrong answer. I think some people will look at this and they'll go, that design's existed before. That's a catamaran. It's not a catamaran. Uh, it's called a swath vessel. So it's a small water plane twin hull vessel <clears throat> that essentially enables us to move the liquid hydrogen that we're sort of using in deploying, which gives us that sort of real dense power for payload to run a range of sensors and, uh, and other equipment on board. What we've actually done is sort of beneath the waterline. We've also taken the approach of being able to make this vessel entirely modular. So from a design perspective, we've been working around how can we build this as cheaply and cost effectively as possible so that we can scale the deployment of these vessels. So within this vessel, there are only five, from a whole perspective, internally there's lots of moving parts uh, in terms of, you know, sort of piping and the rest of it. But in terms of the build of the hull of this vessel, there are only five components in this entire vessel. This vessel can be disassembled and transported anywhere in the world in two 40-foot containers. It means that if you've got from a repair perspective or your replacement perspective, or you want to actually change out the modularity for a different capability or use case, it can be swapped over in a matter of hours rather than having to build an entirely new vessel, an entirely new solution. But the use of liquid hydrogen, as I said, gives us the reliability, the, operate, you know, the ability to operate it out at sea, but it gives us the power of the payload, it gives us the ability to collect vast amounts of data to provide a physical presence out in the ocean. The capabilities from a modular perspective that we're developing include the ability for to deploy a, a towed array for sensing for anti-submarine warfare, to the launch and recover an ROV, a sort of remote operated vehicle, uh, for subsea inspections, asset integrity inspections, and in future the ability to launch and recover UAVs or AUVs, uh, aerial autonomous uh, sort of uh, craft sort of drones, uh, to be able to do things like wind turbines and inspections. So we've really taken this approach from a design perspective around the ability to have a single platform that doesn't need to get bigger and bigger, but instead can be modular to deploy different, uh, different capabilities and different assets. The power on board from the liquid hydrogen gives us not only the power for payload in terms of deploying those sensors, but also then to, uh, to run a whole range of communications, satellite communications, things like uh, sort of VSAT Iridium that will enable us to actually do AI edge-based processing of data from on board the vessel because when it comes to autonomy, uh, you know, you've got command and control. This isn't just about sort of sending a boat out to sea, waiting for it to come back a year or two years later, uh, and then being able to collect the data off it. This is about real-time decision making. And so what we have through the, uh, through, through the comms is the ability to do AI edge-based processing, to look at what the most important uh, data is and relay that in real time. Hydrogen also gives us the ability through this design as well to reach a sprint speed. It's not, you know, certainly not 46 knots in the mad fox but it's the ability to actually to intercept, um, to intercept vessels that may be operating illegally. And as a stat in this case, when it comes to places like the Galapagos Islands, um, you'll probably be horrified to know that in the last uh, four years, the Galapagos Islands, one of the most sort of important marine protected sort of biodiverse sort of regions in the world, have only ever successfully prosecuted one vessel for illegal fishing and operation. And the reason why is there is no physical presence in that area to record footage that enables prosecution of things that are going on because the ocean is so damn big that one sort of one one sort of dot in the ocean, um, one sort of uh, one one sort of asset in the ocean, really doesn't allow you to be in the right place at the right time. You know, the, the, the bad guys know where you are and they sort of avoid you at all costs. So in a second, I'm going to talk a little bit around sort of autonomy from a scale perspective and what that enables. So. Just a little sort of a, a quick sort of summary of some of the things that operation sort of that we've really been focused on. And this is also about as you go through the customer discovery cycles, as you sort of work with end users to understand what is important and what is not, 
you actually hit on things which you otherwise previously wouldn't necessarily have thought about. So one of the benefits of not having a diesel engine, but in fact having a fuel cell sort of where the chemical reaction is, stealth. You also then have the heat that comes off of it because we have a cryogenic tank that is used from a cooling perspective as well. So the vessel is, from a signature uh, and acoustic perspective, it means that it's not interfering with marine sort of wildlife and the likes, but it's also less detectable if you're the bad guy that's looking for the asset out in the sea. As I mentioned before, the ability in terms of the scale to provide for, for things such as mast height, the stability that comes with the swath vessel design as well. So as a 21 ton vessel, this swath vessel has the capabilities and stability of a 300 ton monopod vessel, which means that when you're collecting footage or when you're collecting sensor data, you've got that incredible stability rather than just sort of from a camera perspective, just looking at blue sky, blue ocean, blue sky, blue ocean. So again, when we're talking about actually you know, sort of moving some more roles back into uh, sort of onto land, into high technology, this is where we really see uh, sort of the, the opportunities. But the reason for scale, the reason why we designed this as modular, but why we also designed this to be manufactured rather than built as single units, was based around the size and scale of problems. The UK territorial waters um, measure about 4.5 million square kilometers. We currently have one frigate patrolling that entire area. Uh, frigates are also sort of pretty, pretty lousy when you're sort of chasing Russian submarines as well, simply because the ocean is so damn big. So what we're seeing as a part of the solution where autonomy really makes a huge difference here is the ability to develop these solutions at lower cost, but also to deploy them from a swarm perspective. As I said, when it comes to the defense capabilities, we're looking at about 1.2 uh, billion per vessel. That's a uh, that's a hell of a lot of expenditure on a single asset in a very large, uh, very, very large ocean. Uh, ocean. But it is also, at the moment in the times of conflict, about putting people in dangerous situations where you don't necessarily want them. You also have the growing problem, which is the recruitment. Because crude vessels, crude solutions, crude factories require people, you know, whether it's agriculture, the biggest thing is actually finding the people to put into those positions to, to, to undertake those roles. And those simply don't exist anymore. There is, there is you know, the biggest, the single biggest sort of risk factor for the defence in the UK currently isn't actually price and budgets, which is, you know, is a challenge, but it's recruitment. There are not enough sort of people to go out on vessels at present. So what we're seeing here from a sort of a defence perspective, where autonomy, we believe, from a design and ability, is, is the ability to sort of scale, and it sort of it goes back actually to a, a really old sort of principle from World War II. So at the start of World War II, uh, for, for those of you sort of history buffs, um, so sort the of UK, uh, US sort of went into a land lease sort of program. What they were looking at is how, you know, how essentially could you resupply the Atlantic, you know, how could you build the Atlantic economies, how could you keep sort of free Europe, the UK and sort of allies manned with you know, goods and supplies and sort of uh, fighting equipment and ammunition and the likes. And the answer was the Liberty program, uh, the Liberty Ship program. So at the start of the war, um, the US was producing a Liberty ship, and on average, it was taking about 240 days to come off the production line. By the end of the war, that was 56 days to build an entire ship, from the time the keel was laid down to the ability to get it in the ocean. And what we see from a procurement cycle perspective is if you're able to move towards a manufacturing, so you've got these really sort of flexible, as I say, modular vessels that are able to be built lower cost quickly, beneath procurement sort of actual sort of thresholds, you've got the ability to produce these at scale. Uh, and augment your existing sort of uh, your existing solutions as and when those are required, rather than going through defence procurement cycles, which I think on the uh, the, the Type 26 uh, has been somewhere in the region of about 14 years to get the first vessels in the water. Uh, slightly nearer to home, very similar was done sort of uh, in the, in this sort of neck of the woods, I think, which was uh, you know, the construction of the Spitfire aircraft. But these are principles from a design perspective, from a manufacturing perspective, that have been largely lost to UK industry. I mean, a lot of our manufacturing has sort of gone abroad anyway, and I think it's been a real, real challenge. But we're seeing the ability that autonomous and uh, this high technology has, has been giving us the ability to, in fact, have a, a consistent sort of, or, or persistent state of readiness, whereby in the event we need to scale up solutions, we can do that very, very quickly, because we have, um, we have the capabilities, we have the ability here from a UK supply chain to be able to augment our, uh, our systems, our forces, our workforces. This doesn't have to be just about defence, this is also about all things to do with manufacturing, warehousing, all the likes, the ability in the right time, seasonality, to scale up. 
This could be also about you know, how within the post office, when you reach those peak periods, how do you actually scale up your solutions and deliver that uh, more readily? Um, and and yeah, there are examples all over the world in every sort of uh, every industry uh, around how this can be done more effectively. And I think you know, as a society, we need to embrace the fact that you know, back to the dull, dangerous, and dirty jobs. This isn't an attack or an assault on individuals and employment. This is about being able to build capabilities where they are required most, removing people from the dull, dangerous, and dirty jobs. It has the ability as well from a deployment perspective uh, to mean that we can actually replace that one ship in the ocean over those millions of square kilometers with the ability to deploy multiple, multiple assets. Uh, be this in the channel, be this in the Galapagos Islands, be this elsewhere in the world. When you've got large tracts of ocean, when you've got that distance, that in sort of inability to cover large areas, moving towards swarm and fleet, um, swarm and fleet technology will enable us to, to do that. Um, I think sort of the pitfalls uh, that I just wanted to sort of wrap up on here are to not do what the UK did during COVID, whereby there were some brilliant sort of ideas probably going back to the sort of the mid uh, 2000s, whereby it was you know, we will have a national stockpile of PPE, which was then just left in warehouses, cupboards. Nobody checked it. I think 90% of it was out of date by the time we had a uh, by the time we actually sort of went into full sort of COVID pandemic mode. So I think when we're moving towards autonomous solutions, when we're moving towards <coughs> manufacturing, this is also not about just sort of keeping stock on the shelf in the event that there is a need to scale up. It's about building that robustness through the supply chain. And so what we're doing sort of at Acron, where we've been really focused on is working across the entire supply chain. So we um, have currently been the recipients of eight Innovate UK grants, uh, six of them alive currently. Um, so we've received just over sort of two and a half million pounds to date in funding, uh, through the, primarily through the Clean Maritime Demonstration Competition, which is a multi-year commitment from the UK government to move towards decarbonisation in the maritime sector. And as I said, you know, with our hydrogen systems and, and moving towards green hydrogen, we see this as having that ability in terms of capabilities and payloads and the likes, but also moving towards zero emission as well. So we, we, we see uh, sustainability within the defence sector as being a value add, but also being a sort of a capability add as well. So this is about sort of changing mentalities uh, in how we sort of deploy systems um, and how we sort of deploy sort of processes and manufacturing processes to bring more back into the UK so that we're able to, to scale and adjust accordingly. So, so that was my kind of like, I have no idea whether that was a lot of time or a little time. I think that might have been just about time. Just all right, mate, don't worry. Super. Um, <coughs> questions? I've got to start with. So you've got a 21 tonne Big Bertha there. Um, how did you get around some minimal viable product? You go to investors, you go to competitions, to the lovely renders, but how are you proving that that's going to do what it does? So for us, it was looking what our key differentiator was, which was the hydrogen systems. <coughs> so the first thing we developed out was the internal electrical hydrogen command systems of the vessel. We have the additional challenge with autonomy. So from a regulatory perspective, there's the regulation of hydrogen, but there's also the regulation of hydrogen autonomous systems. So we went through an incredibly sort of, uh, sort of complex design phase, but also consultation from day one with the regulator. What we'd seen was a lot of competitors in this market failing by simply going off and designing stuff and then actually not being regulated for fun. So we went through the process of developing this. This meant that in April uh, 2022, we became the first, uh, the first maritime organization in the world to get Lloyd's Register approval in principle on our hydrogen systems, and that became the catalyst. What it also became the catalyst for was the ability to, 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 sort of, um, to essentially develop our hydrogen powertrain system for this vessel and our vessel meant we also got substantial interest from other industries, from fishing vessels, from crew transfer vessels, from offshore patrol vessels, who turned around and went, by 2025, to the regulations, whether they still exist in a couple of months' time will be another, another matter, uh, given sort of potential bonfire of green sort of legislation that may come in. But the UK is committed, fully committed to being um, all new vessels built and manufactured in the UK and operating in UK territorial waters have to be zero emission by 2025. And so to that end, we've got a huge amount of commercial interest looking in in very, very sort of scalable, uh, in very scalable markets as well in parallel to this. So keeping options open. Very much so. Excellent. Has anyone else got any questions? Oh, I'm running around with the microphone. Oh, it's been brilliant. Um, just a quick one. <coughs> 
obviously you're at a, a forefront in many technologies and many sectors as, as you're going here. So in terms of personnel, yeah. how have you found the right personnel and how do you find those people with the right skills and sort of mindset to approach what you're working on? Uh, excellent question. I think that is probably on our risk register, talent attraction is top three. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's getting tougher. Um, to some extent, actually, I, I'll, I'll sort of slightly caveat that. Uh, current challenges in the UK economy, and particularly in the technology sector, means there has been, come in the last kind of six months or so, more talent, more available now. But when it comes to things like, so, so, and I would say a lot of that is on the robotic software perspective as well. There's been some very well, sort of, um, well known sort of failures of big tech technology companies, which means talent is coming to the market. But on the hydrogen systems, this is, this is a real, real challenge. This is a global challenge. We're seeing investment into you know, hydrogen technology reaching, probably in the region of about 600 billion US dollars has been announced in the last six months. That is a shit ton of people that are needed to go out and actually build and operate and sort of uh, and, and work in this from, from engineers to, to all sorts of specialists, to molecule specialists and the likes. Um, I would say what we have also done, so we've kept our network incredibly broad. We have partnered wherever possible. So as a startup, our leverage, you know, getting into big organizations is, is pretty small. You know, we can find out and say, hey, we've got some funding, uh, we're, we're kind of an exciting startup. Um, most simply just won't, won't answer your calls. But by going in and sort of partnering, so you know, working with the likes of their products, um, not just sort of gasifying the world, organizations like that and saying actually what we what we would like to do is uh, do a joint application joint bid that becomes part of it there is and, and I would say as well from a, from a talent uh, attraction perspective you're continually sort of building your network of experts at all times and, and sort of outreach a lot of this is about PR and marketing you're also building a startup culture where people want to come and work so I think in, in tougher times as people move towards things like co-working and hybrid working and you know, they put more value on working in companies that have a sustainable and ethical sort of model. Um, I should have said our vessels are totally non lethal we're not putting torpedoes and missiles on them as well, uh, at any stage. But what, what we're talking about is okay, coming to work in an exciting environment, and, and that's you know, been part of the strategy, but it's, it's a tough environment out there. Cool. We'll take time for one more little question. Okay. Um, how do you balance uh, trying to promote yourself and collaborate with protecting your IP? A uh, great question, and we, we do, we have you know, previously gotten a little nervous with some of the large organisations. The UK, um, UK tech sector is particularly interesting because, whereas in the US there's a lot of venture capital funding that enables startups to scale really, really quickly, often here in the UK you've got to go through, in, in the defence sector, through a prime to get in there. And what you often find is that a lot of great, you know, fantastic UK startups are acquired incredibly early because it's really tough to raise venture funding here in the UK, particularly for hardware. I mean, hard tech is hard uh, to get off the ground. And, and so what you find is a lot of sort of really cool novel ideas are sort of snuffed out quite early on. So we've sort of sort of tried to sort of straddle that and part wherever, wherever possible, co-develop wherever possible, but sort of protecting the two pieces of IP. But it is an ongoing uh, battle. And we've, we've been sort of quite lucky. One of the, you know, for anyone that's from a startup, one of the uh, sort of top tips is the UK IP office actually does things like free patent audits and the likes. You can audit your competitors, you can do sort of road mapping and planning. Um, but it is also part of the exit strategy as well for the business as well. Build up a strong enough sort of uh, IP uh, portfolio that when it does come to a potential sort of acquisition uh, in future, you've, you've essentially got valuable uh, value in the business uh, to be acquired. But it is a continual time growth. Perfect. Right, a big round of applause on my